Well, thank you again for joining and welcome to our Side by Side. As we continue to think about these characteristics in the character of a Christian, the Beatitudes, today we're going to think about purity. Yesterday we were thinking about mercy and purity. It's very close. All of these are, they are so interconnected. They really are like a body. You can't have one without the other the hand and the foot and the eye and the head and so forth. But before we get into that, can I ask you just for, um, if, you would, if you wouldn't mind praying for two people. Uh, one is Brian. Brian has got, uh, he's going through what we could say the valley of the shadow, literally in these days. He is a young man who's had a long journey with cancer, but has demonstrated such grace and such faith, and he has been a great testimony. So if you could remember, Brian and his wife is Jackie, and uh, they're dear friends of ours in Portrush. And then there's a Jennifer, is another young, another young woman who has got cancer, and she's also going through a considerable journey at the moment. And she would value your prayer. She's asked to share her situation with our friends. So if you just remember those two, two families, two folks and their families, I think the Lord will, will extend mercy to them. We were thinking about mercy yesterday. And one way we can be merciful is by praying, I think, very much so. So as we think about purity today, if you go back into the Bible, purity was one of those things that people spent a lot of time maintaining and developing. But they did it in such a way that it was largely ceremonial. So in other words, they would avoid lots of things <clears throat> like not touching dead bodies, not associating with undesirables. It was all don't, don't, don't. And what this was doing was establishing a sort of an external purity, allowing you to access the rituals of the temple and the services and the worship. But when now in this sermon, Jesus makes so much more of what was given in shadow. In other words, what was given in the Old Testament shadow, he shows the reality so that all of the externals, he says, now must become inward. He says, you have heard it this way, but I say to you, so that what was external on the surface, what was shadow and symbol is now to become heart deep and real. So this is the reality he's speaking of. And the human heart speaks of something at the core of our being. That's what it's all about. The human heart is who we are at the very core of our being. It is that which is to be altered, and it's that which then allows all this other change to take place. You may remember Jesus speaking of the Pharisee and how they cleaned the outside of the cup while the inside was left filthy. I think this is in some measure what Jesus is speaking of here. Let's get to the heart. And this is indeed, I think, the theme of the whole Sermon on the Mount. Something of purity of heart is a single-minded, all one way. Uh, all Jesus, none self. All good, no bad. So that we could say, not just the action, but the motive as well. And that is very true. You could say it's living without a mask, which is, of course, the meaning of not being a hypocrite. And that's very very key to what's going on about purity. For hypocrisy is pretending to be something on the outside that you are not on the inside. So the idea of hypocrisy is, is with a mask, living with a mask on. Now, who among us can say that they're completely pure in heart? We know that only Jesus was pure. And in all our lives, there will be mixtures, mixtures of motives. There are deceptions, even small deceptions. And we all know the fabrication or the temptation to fabricate a few details. Well, at least I do. Even the study for this side by side has been a daily challenge to me. It's constantly revealing to me my own heart. And of course, if you want to look at this in more detail, just as I referred to Matthew 18 for reading yesterday, why not go back to read Luke eleven forty two to 52 and there it talks about the internal and the external, and Jesus is contrasting what really needs to be. This heart, purity of heart, reveals this purity of character. The two are in harmony, behaviour, and the source of where that behaviour comes from. 
Then we see, we read here, that those who are pure in heart will see God. That's why I ask the question, does impurity hinder sight? Or does it create the inability to cope with the utter perfection of God so that, that you just could not see God? What does seeing God mean? Scripture gives hints, but no real definitive explanation, I think. And going back to the Old Testament, we know the occasion when Moses asked if he could see God's glory. And what did God do? He put him in a cleft of a rock and he set him so that he could just see his back, as it were. He couldn't see God. Then we think of Jesus saying, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, John Stott says this, and I quote, Only the pure in heart will see God. See him now with the eye of faith and his glory in the hereafter. For only the utterly sincere can bear the dazzling vision in whose light the darkness of deceit must vanish and by whose fire all dross, all shame will be burned up. Somehow the state of our hearts will affect both what we see and how we see it, I think. I'm not totally sure if I'm on the right track in saying that, but follow with me a minute. But take, for example, an envious heart. The envious heart cannot see the good in another. They look cynically and judgmentally. Uh, Their capacity or something about their sight is poisoned by their heart. And many people so-called religious around Jesus could not see who he was. They couldn't see Jesus. Jesus saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They could not see who Jesus was because they were jealous. They, they hated the fact that he had popularity and that he spoke things that condemned them in their hearts. And so perhaps there is something in this idea that the state of our hearts affects how we see what we see. Then ask this question, how is the heart to be made pure? Well, Scripture tells us, it tells us that a young person may keep their way pure by taking heed unto the Word of God. And I think it's clear in Scripture that there's something very strong between the relationship between our capacity to be pure and to see and scripture. Listen to what some scriptures say. Psalm 51 7 says, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Jeremiah 4 14 talks about people having their hearts washed from evil. And then Paul talks about when he's talking to the church in Corinthian, Corinthians 1, Corinthians 6 11, he says, But you were washed, you were sanctified. And I think it becomes even more clear when he's writing to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5, 26, and he says that the Lord had cleansed her, that's the church, by the washing of water with the word. Titus 3, 5 says, by the washing of regeneration and renewal. And I think what we're seeing here is something of the relationship between the word and what the word conveys, the truth, Faith comes by hearing and that by the word of God. The word of God's power and effect in our lives has a washing effect. Jesus, in reference to Peter in John 13, when he says, oh, wash all of me, he says, no, no, no. He says, a person doesn't need to be washed if they've had a bath, just their, just their feet. And there's a sense in which I think he's saying is the, the washing of regeneration and renewal, this, this transformation that happens creates a purity of heart but there's the necessity to maintain it. Just like Peter needs to have his feet washed, we need daily to have our feet, as it were, washed. Our interaction in the world, the flesh and the devil, create a sense of filth around our lives that needs to be washed off. And I think that's what he's speaking of here. How do we keep our way pure? By taking heed unto the word of God. There's a cleansing, washing effect of the word of God It reveals the dirt and it reveals the way to cleanse us. So there's the repentance and belief going on day by day. It's it's very simple, but it's, it's essential. And even though washing is simple, it's essential. 
and we know that, don't we? Pandemics told us the need to wash, to get rid of the powerful dangers that could affect and infect. So too the washing of the word in our lives day by day.